Another one, before an accident occurs, before an injury happens, is through un uninsured motorist coverage and underinsured motorist coverage. Explain what that means. Well, um, as you, when you get in an accident, the negligent party has, is supposed to at least have certain insurance coverage. A, a large majority of the drivers out there are underinsured, and that's because they get the, the absolute minimums. In Colorado, that's $25,50. $25,000 of coverage per person, $50,000 coverage total in the accident. Uh, there's, I can't say a majority, but there's a, a, a big percentage of drivers that don't have any insurance at all. And although they're by law required to have it, they don't. So your protection to protect you against the injuries you sustain uh, lies in having a, a high enough coverage in the uninsured and underinsured motorist coverage. Uninsured motorist coverage is that your own insurance company will step into the shoes of the uninsured driver. This isn't just the uninsured driver. It can be a phantom car. If a car runs you off the road and you end up getting hurt and that car disappears, you have uninsured motorist coverage, which allows you to then get paid by your own insurance company for your injuries. And that rule applies even if there's no contact between the phantom driver car and your car. Correct. If the phantom car, as we call it because it's not around anymore, caused you to be injured, you have the right to collect as if your own insurance company is insuring that phantom car. Sometimes we, we have a situation where the other driver stays at the scene, the other driver doesn't have any insurance or it just expired. We've seen that happen before. So or you're hurt in, to the extent of fifty or seventy-five thousand dollars, but the driver only has twenty-five thousand. And so if if somebody gets the highest UM uninsured motorist limits and the highest UIM underinsured motorist limits, what does that do for them? Well, it makes sure they have money to take care of them for the losses they've sustained. And it's not just medical losses or medical bills in this case. It can be for loss of work. It can be for your pain and suffering. It can be for your loss of enjoyment of life or for the disability or the disfigurement. It can be for a number of, of areas that you're entitled to, to receive coverage. You have to remember, there's a lot of people out there, drunk drivers, who are minimally covered. They can cause significant and severe accidents, uh, cause people to suffer hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars worth of damages. And if you're not carrying coverage for yourself, you're making a big mistake because the chances are that kind of coverage is not with the drivers who are out there on the roads. So when you get med pay, you can have your medical bills paid, and when you get UM coverage, uninsured motorist coverage, if the other driver does not have any insurance or if the at-fault driver doesn't have enough insurance, your damages, injuries, and losses can be paid through your own car insurance coverage. That's right. That's the whole reason why uh, we talk to you on our radio show, we talk to you in our website, we talk to you many, many times whenever we get the opportunity and we talk to the public to tell them you want to have, make sure you're protected before the accident. And that means setting the stage before you ever get in your car with the proper insurance that's going to protect you. All right, so far we've covered med pay you can do before an accident or injuries occur. You can have UIM and UIM coverage and raise your limits before an accident or injuries occur and right. that will help you before these uh, traumas happen. What about wearing your seat belt? Don't we have new case law about wearing your seat belt? Sure and we all know we're supposed to wear our seat belt. Uh, we see many times on the on the TV and we hear on the radio people who have died or get are injured to a greater degree than they otherwise would have because they didn't have their seat belt on. If you don't have your seat belt at the time of the accident you cannot collect your non-economic damages. Non-economic damages are damages for your pain and suffering. There are damages for disfigurement, if you sustain any scarring. Uh, there are damages for disability, if, uh, to the extent you can't do things you used to be able to do before the accident. Uh, it's, it's not a good idea to, even for a few minutes, be without your seatbelt on. You, you should keep that seatbelt on at all times. Otherwise, you're going, to, you're going to severely impair your right to recover. You're going to be left only being able to recover your economic losses, which are usually the medical bills that you have out of pocket, and usually it's going to be some kind of lost income if you're working. So one of the first questions we ask people when they come into our law firm is, were you wearing your seatbelt? Because that, that affects the amount and the ability to recover from the at-fault in, uh, person's insurance company. Oh, this is such an important issue. It's not only one of the first questions we ask, 
It's one of the first questions the paramedics ask when they're on scene. It's one of the first things they write if you're not able to talk to them and they find you in the accident. It's one of the first questions defense lawyers ask when you've been in the when they take your deposition. It's one of the first questions that the insurance adjusters will ask when they're talking to you about what happened. And they, they will do everything they can to determine whether or not it's true they had that seatbelt on. Um, I, I have little doubt that the day is coming when they're going to be talking or they're going to be able to get into the black box of cars and be able to find from computers whether or not the seatbelt was engaged at least at the time of the accident. And some of those black boxes can do that uh, right now as we talk. That's correct. So, so, so you should cars. fasten your seatbelt not just for your own uh, physical safety but if you're injured in an accident, you don't know the accident's coming, that's one of the one of the ways that you can protect yourself to recover from the insurance company for the at fault party. Right. All right. Now let's talk about uh, snow and ice. All right. A lot of people say, "Well, it was snow and ice. It was black ice. It was icy. It's snow." What can you do to protect your family? What do you need to know about snow and ice when you're when you're driving um, in normal normal conditions? Well. I, I don't want, want to get too much into driving tips, you know, because it's going to depend on the car and whether you're four-wheel drive and your stopping distances. It's going to talk a lot about what, you know, if you're in an old-time car or whether you have ABS brakes, a number of those questions. But what you can do when you're involved in driving in those conditions is you, you need to make sure that, for instance, if you have your children, that they're belted in, that they're properly protected, that they're in the right seats, that, that the, the, the appropriate adjustments have been made. You need to make sure that you're not putting yourself in a situation where you're faced with a sudden emergency. And a sudden emergency is where you lose control over your vehicle. You need to make sure that you're watching what the other vehicles are doing and making sure that you're not placing them in a sudden emergency where they're having to take some kind of extra precaution because of the way you're driving. But So the bottom line is you should adjust your driving habits to match the snow and ice conditions. And that's always going to be considered. Right. And the bottom line is you cannot use as an excuse there was snow, there was ice, because the case law has held that snow and ice are not sudden emergencies. Well, a lot of times that's what the other side tries to use. They try to say, well, I hit onto an icy patch, or I, I hit onto the snow, or I, I had a problem and I lost control of my car. Now, they're going to examine the way you've been driving to determine whether or not that's true because you may be placing yourself in your own emergency. When you get in your car and you know it's a snowy day, you shouldn't be aware of the fact that you have that, that problem. So even though the speed limit says 45 miles an hour, sometimes you have to drive less than that because of the snow and ice conditions. Of course. Okay, so Brad, so far we've covered med pay, where you can do this in advance of an injury or an accident to protect you and your family. We've covered UM, UIM coverage, uninsured motorists, and underinsured motorist coverage to protect you and your family. We've talked about seat belts and we've talked about driving and snow and ice, all for the purpose of protecting you and your family before a tragedy occurs. Yeah, and, there, and there's a lot more. I mean, contact should be made. I mean, we're talking about what should you have inside your car? Should you have a camera? Should you try to, if, if, you, if you've been hit or if there's been a problem, should you take pictures of the area, pictures of the cars, pictures of the damages? Is that something you want? It probably is. Do you want to make sure you, you do notes immediately after the accident or as soon as possible? Yes. Uh, these are things that become very important because what you see today in the accident may not be what the other side sees or what the police officer hears, especially if you're being carted off to the hospital and you're going to the, in, in an ambulance somewhere and the only person left to talk to the police officer is the person who hit you. And later on in the se virtual injury seminar, we're going to be talking about hit and runs. We're going to be talking about what you do in a hit and run situation and how you report this to the police.